Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about the rectangle approximation method. Basically it's a way of, uh, uh, well, three different ways of estimating the area between a function and the horizontal axis of a graph. Uh, real quick, um, if you had to do the discovery on your own, I wanted to make sure we all had the same answers on the back page here. So I'm going to go back up a page to the, the discovery activity where I had to estimate um, some area using different amounts of rectangles. And the big thing I wanted you to notice is as you used more and more, especially the midpoint ones, you got closer and closer to the actual area um, between the graph and the function. And then there was um, a problem at the end where you were supposed to, you know, try and come up with a pattern here. And it, it depends on the first derivative. <coughs> so if the function is strictly increasing, uh, then, then using left-sided rectangles is always going to give you an under-approximation. And so the reason why is because, like, look at this, this graph here. If I'm using the left side to build my rectangle, or rather, mm, if I'm going to build four rectangles here, one, two, three, and four, and I use the left side to define the height, that's the important thing, using the left side to define the height, then I'm always going to be underneath the function, or at best I'm going to be tied at that one single point. So see how building um, with my rectangles, making the height match the function on the left side, how that gave me an underestimate. And if we use um, the right side as the height, so again I'm going to make a rectangle in each of these windows, but this time if I use the right side of the width for the height, now I've got an overestimate. Now this is going to give me too much area. And then um, you just get the exact opposite if the function is strictly decreasing. Um, I don't have a visual example for you, but hopefully it's not too hard to, to apply the logic the other way. So, whoops, that's not strictly decreasing. How about something like this? So, again, if you're building your rectangles on the left side, or the height is on the left side of the interval, see how this would always be over? Or if we use the right side, now our height would always be under. So, cool. Okay, so it turns out um, the area between the function and the axis of the graph is is very, very interesting to us in calculus. Um, if you've taken physics, and I know you, you just love hearing me say that, right? But if, if you've taken physics with e either me or Mr. Ballou, at some point by now or by the end of like this week, you should have talked about velocity and time gap. So let's just talk about something super basic. Let's say we had an object, maybe it's your car, and you drive it down the highway, and you set the cruise control at a constant, um, I don't care, 60 miles per hour. So you're not speeding up, you're not slowing down, that's why my graph isn't going up or down. And then um, we would have you find the area underneath that graph for a certain region certain amount of time. And let's talk about what that area would actually be. So like, if we go back to geometry, right, area is just length times width or base times height, whatever. But <coughs> the height here, this height, that would be some measure of velocity. Mm, how do I want to notate this for you? Well, let's just use the L times W. Okay. So instead of height, I've got some amount of velocity. And then instead of width, I have some amount of time. So really, this area would be velocity times time. Well, velocity times time, speed times time, that's going to give you some measure of distance or displacement. Um, which, again, if you haven't taken physics, that's just the definition of how something's position changed from point A to point B. So that's crazy, right? The area underneath a velocity graph can tell us how much um, something's position changed. And there's a ton of applications like that in calculus. So that's just the most basic one here. So that's why I'm having you calculate uh, area. <coughs> um, let's see. So then... The abbreviation for this approximation method, uh, rectangle approximation method, is RAM. And then the first letter, so MRAM, LRAM, RRAM, 
just stands for where you're defining the height of the rectangles. So M stands for midpoint, L stands for left, R stands for right. Um, let's see. Oh, what did we notice? Well, we already talked about this, but more rectangles uh, produce a better approximation. Um, let's see. Okay, so I had a problem here. Like, as the numbers get bigger and bigger, it's very, very annoying to do by hand. You were probably cursing me as you did this one with the 16 rectangles. I don't blame you. Um, and so I have a calculator program to help us out with this, but if you can see it there, the PI Inspire stuff, well, it's been pinwheeling for the last 10 minutes, so I don't know if we're going to get it today. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll get that loaded onto your calculators um, next time I see you. And if you have the calculator program on your computer, I dropped the file on Canvas, so you can download it and plug it in there if you want. Um, obviously, this video is a lot better if you actually have that program. Uh, so in the meantime, this will have to do. I have put a link to this Desmos calculator on Canvas. It's under the Supplemental Resources page. I named it uh, Desmos RAM Visualizer. And I've loaded in the function that you used in the sample. No, go away. In the uh, discovery activity before. And I'll just explain how to work it real quick because um, I do think it is a great visualizer over here. First thing is it's going to ask you for the left and right side of where you want the area. So in the discovery activity, we did from x is negative 4 to x is positive 4. And then it's going to ask you for the number of intervals. That means how many rectangles you want to use. So the first thing we did was four of them. This one here is just a straight coding thing. Um, set this number here to 0 if you want it to make the, the height of the rectangle on the left side. Set it to a half if you want it to use midpoint, the middle of the rectangle for the height. And then set it to 1 if you want it to define the height at the right side of the rectangle. So I'm going to set it at 0 0.5 because that's what you did in the discovery activity. And then if you scroll just a little bit more, ignore this messy notation for now. The, the important thing here is that our estimate came out to 56, which is what we said in the discovery activity. And then if we just check to make sure this works 5.62, say 8, comes out to 58, which is, again, what we said. So um, I'll use that instead for this example one here. Oh, hey, look. This thing finally loaded 10 days later. Well, I've already showed you how to use this one. So how about I show you how to use the inspiring class? This is a better visual representation of it anyway, as long as it works. So I've changed the function to match the one in example one. Example one, now it's got t plus one squared. I plugged in x plus one squared. It's going to be functionally the same thing. And then um, it says for t greater than zero. OK, so I'm going to make my left bound, my lower bound, zero. And then the question is, where is the particle? Where is the particle when t equals six? I'm going to make my upper bound six because I want the displacement over the first six seconds. So I need to find the area um, over t equals zero from zero to six, that'll give me the displacement over that time. Um, ba, 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 ba. And then conveniently, well, we'll come back to that later. So, let's see, I've got, nope, wrong window. Sorry, guys. So let's push this up to zero. Okay, I'm just going to do this as my mouse. I'm going to come back. There we go. Much better. Okay, so I've got our function. I've got our lower bound for area at 0, our upper bound is at 6. And then now I need to set the number of rectangles. The first table says to make it 3. It says n equals 3, that's how many rectangles. And then we need the left ram, the right ram, and the, well, the left ram, the midpoint ram, and the right ram. So what did I put on Desmos first? Um, I think I left it at midpoint. So let's see, for the midpoint approximation, that'd be 112. And come back here. Then I'll set this to zero so that way it gives me the left side and see how now all my rectangles are smaller. And that, go away, preview. This was so low. Okay, all right. 70. 
and then one more. So now so they're all built on the right side. You can see that's way too much area. That'd be 166. Okay, so like I said, I put the link for this on Canvas. The only thing you're going to have to do is just fix up the equation. But uh, I won't make you watch me punch in all the numbers here. Okay, so if we take the time to evaluate all of them, I want you to notice that even though originally when we don't use very many rectangles, the left ram is like way under and the right ram was way over, they all eventually do converge all on the same number, at least getting close to the same number, right? So the middle one, if we use 500 rectangles, which would take us a million years to do by hand, um, we come up with something that rounds to straight 114. And then the left side rectangles, they're getting really close. They're just a little under 11 or 114, and the right side of the rectangles are just barely over 114. So my guess that the actual distance traveled is going to be somewhere around 144 uh, meters. And so that's the huge idea here. Um, as we use more and more rectangles, the difference between which method we use of approximating disappears. So the, uh, the whole rectangle thing with the calculator or on Desmos, that's all great, but not everything in calculus or in life for that matter can be perfectly matched with a function. So what I've got on this next page is an example of where let's just say some data was collected over time, but maybe there's not really a function that matches it. So, so we've got a car that's driving down the road and speeding up and slowing down. So we recorded the instantaneous velocity at just random intervals. And then our job is to estimate, why can't I read? There we go. Estimate the length of the road using LRAM and then RRAM. So the only difference here is we're just gonna have to build the rectangles ourselves and they might not be of consistent width. Like when we were doing the graphing thing, the rectangles were all the same width, right? Well, if we don't have a function, we can't guarantee that that's gonna happen. That's okay. So basically all I gotta do now is figure out all my widths and then which height I'm going to apply to which width. So let's see, like from zero to eight, that one's easy. The width there is eight. And then 15 to eight, that's seven. Uh, this is a difference of 9, that's a difference of 14. Nope, that's not 11, that's the other way around. 4, and then what, 18. Okay, so then, since area is just, you know, base, or let's say width, because that's the word I was using, times height, then for our left rectangle approximation, I'm going to use all these widths times the height on the left side of the width. So let me just switch colors here. So like I'm going to first use the width 8 and the height on the left side would be 0. And then I'm just going to add up all the areas of the rectangles. So like my next width is 7, the height on the left side is 44. Then I got a width of 9, the height on the left side is 39. So 9 times 39. And then I'll reach for my calculator, push the buttons, you can push the buttons. I think this is going to come out with, nope, that's not what it is. How about this? 2,761 feet. 
and this will be my left side approximation. For my right side approximation, we're just going to, we're going to use the exact same widths. I'm just going to attribute the height to be the other side of the rectangle. That was a terrible sentence. How could I have made that better? I'm going to use the height on the left side, on the right side of the interval. So here's my R ram. I still got the same widths, right? So I still got the 8, 7, 9, whatever. But now I'm going to attach the height. Or I'm going to use the height that's on the right side there. So we got, we still got our 8. This time it's going to be times the 44 to 7 times the 39. So you get where I'm going with this. Which here they all come out. We punch it in our calculator. And again, somewhere around 2,700 feet, this time 2,740. Okay, so I mean, it's, it's pretty reasonable to assume that this road, this, or the car drove about maybe 2,750 feet. So we're just ballparking it. Um, but here's our, here's our two estimates. Okay. Uh, thanks for hanging in there, even though the technology didn't originally work the way I wanted it to. I will get you the and the program for the Enspire that shows you or gets you the area, and I'll show you how to work it in class tomorrow. Thanks.